Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday, May 2nd, 8.30 a.m. here in Minnesota, and it's wet outside. For those who are, aren't aware, I um, went golfing yesterday, and my feet got wet. It was standing water almost everywhere, but uh, also it was the King of Wings event yesterday for the Sanford Auxiliary, and that was a lot of fun, so thank you for those of you who went out to support. It's a really good organization um, that supports a lot of really good people that are going through tough situations out at the Sanford Auxiliary there. So, with that, uh, as always, our weekly retirement planning coffee talks are an informal way are an informal way for me to have conversations and answer questions with people, even if they are not my clients for free. You are welcome to join the Facebook Live as we're here right now, or stop by my office, which is currently downtown Thief River Falls. Uh, on that, a little more on that in a minute. But there is no pressure to work with me or become my client by stopping by in person or online. It is simply just a conversation, a good opportunity to hopefully provide value. It is my mission to provide the highest quality advice and service possible to my clients. Therefore, I limit myself to only having 100 or less active clients at all times that I have a fiduciary responsibility to. Even though I limit myself to only working with 100 clients at any given time, it is still important to me to provide as much value as I can to as many good people as possible, which is why these conversations are so important to me. Disclaimer, this content is not legal, tax, or investment advice. You should always consult a qualified professional regarding your personal situation. And this is, is live, so I may make a mistake from time to time, even though I'll do my best not to. I look forward to having some great conversations and, have you, and hope you have a wonderful day, whether you're watching it live or at a later date or listening to the podcast. Uh, with that, are there any questions to start? Uh, please put them in the comment section now or at any time during this live video. I have one hour set aside on my calendar to answer questions, but if there's not enough to take up an hour, I will probably wrap it up around 30 minutes. All right, so I don't see any questions yet, so I'll just start off by saying, um, first off, Thanks to all of those who reached out and congratulated me yesterday. I don't know the exact day I started um, working my internship with Foster Klima back in 2014, um, but it was May. I know that. So I just, uh, this month marks my 10th year in this business, and I'm really excited and grateful for that because, uh, you know, the th three people or the three, I guess, four people that stay, that have been the most impactful in my career have been, obviously, of course, my wife. And her constant in uh, support in me um, and belief in my ability to do what I love and make a you know a successful business out of it. I know in the early years there that I, I loved what I did, but I didn't make very much money and was very financially stressed. So it would have been really easy for me to leave and go do something else. But she always just insisted that I do what I love and that I would figure it out. Um, rather than going to maybe taking a job that would pay me significantly more money and have a lot more security but it wouldn't be necessarily what I love doing. So first shout out to her. She's an amazing human being that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I'm at and I'll never will be get to where I'd be able to, I'll never get to where I could get to if it wasn't for her. So second would be my parents. Uh, they've been extremely supportive. And in those early years when I was extremely financially stressed, um, I can still remember finding out that I couldn't use my MacBook from college to do this job at Foster Klima. So I had to go buy a Surface Pro. Well, I didn't have the money. I had no money to my name. I graduated from college, with, or I left college with over you know, $55,000 of student loan debt, um, had maxed out my credit card at that time. I literally didn't have access to the money to buy a laptop. So I had to call my dad, well, I had to walk downstairs because I didn't want anyone to hear me having to call my dad and telling him I didn't have the money. Um, but I had to call my dad and, and basically ask if I could borrow money to buy a laptop. And even though it wasn't a big deal for him, it was a really big deal for me because uh, one, I never, I don't like asking for anything, especially getting help, but it's it's not a great feeling when you have to do that. And then also call to ask for money to fill up your car for gas because you got to get to meetings and things like that. So without them, again, I was very, I've been very blessed. And then third, the third person would be Ross Welty. Uh, for those who don't know, he's my business partner currently, but and he's been my colleague for my entire career, my mentor, my entire career, because he chose to be my mentor at Foster Klima when he could have chose someone else. And who knows where my life would have ended up if I would have had someone else as my mentor. Um, since then, we went from Foster Klima to Solid Rock Financial Group together, more as a colleague, a relationship, less as like a mentor, or less as like me being his intern. Um, and then when he decided to start Five Stone Financial Group, I was blessed with the opportunity to come over and help him uh, start, grow, and establish a brand new company 
um, completely from scratch. So Five Stone Financial Group owns Five Stone Investments, which is a registered investment advisory company, completely new, not, does not leveraging any currently established or old um, established business. And Five Stone, Finan or Five Stone Insurance is also a completely new and established business. So I'm really proud of that opportunity and grateful for everything Ross has done for me over the years. So that's all, I'm really grateful for that uh, and, and the ability to be in this business for 10 years. Um, I know a lot of it, it takes uh, takes a lot of support and I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without a lot of those people. And last but not least, my clients. So without my clients, I would have no income and without their trust, I wouldn't have clients. So the trust of my clients and their belief in me to work with me and take my advice and there's not really a better feeling in the world than making a living helping other people achieve their goals and improve their financial future. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can say that in their different industries, but in my personal experience, it feels really great to one, know a client trusts me, but two, be able to see them actually achieve the goal they previously told me they wanted to achieve and because of their hard work. So that's been really grateful and I'm really excited about that and I appreciate uh, those listening to me now that I've talked about for about five more minutes. I will put that down. I'm done with that until I'm in this business for 20 years and then maybe I'll bring it up again. But with that, um, again, if you have any questions or thoughts, please put them in the, in the comments if you're looking at starting a business or um, kind of learning more about the, running a business. I also have another business called North Stars Properties TRF. So I do have some business experience um, in the real estate world as well. Um, I'm more than happy to sit down and have a conversation with you and hopefully I can provide value or connect you with someone who can, uh, whether it's through the Two Rivers Entrepreneur Connection or Rotary or things like that. I've been blessed to develop some relationships with some really, really great people that I think could be valuable or helpful if I'm not able to be. So just reach out and let me know. I'm always uh, excited about helping the next person as much as I can. So the other thing as far as news goes in my business uh, in helping people as an advisor is I'm moving. So for the last, th wow, we moved back to town in 2016. So the last eight years or seven years ish, I don't remember exactly when I moved into this space. I've been in downtown Three River Falls in the same exact location. It used to be owned by the China King. And now in the last three years, it's been owned by Sarah Lunky, Sarah Jane Boutique. And she's done an absolutely amazing job the last three years, completely re-updating this building and providing an amazing office space for me. So I'm nothing but grateful for to Sarah. Please go check out her store if you haven't already. She's doing an, she's doing an amazing job over there, and I think she's got uh, really awesome ideas for what she wants to do for this space. But we'll see what what the future brings for her. Um, but my lease is up, in, so knowing that my lease is up in July, and at then at some point by the end of July, I'll be moving over to the ODC building, uh, Suite B, which is 1520 Highway 32 South, Thief River Falls, Minnesota. I'm still doing online meetings for those who don't, don't want to meet in person or can't or whatever the reason. And that's a temporary place because eventually, um, Brittany and I plan on building a house and I will, I, my intentions will be to build a home office. It'll be separate. So don't worry. You don't have to, if you're in a meeting with me, it's completely separate from the house. It's going to have its own entryway. Um, but I'm going to have a home office where I can host meetings in person or online. And that, that's going to be nice as well. And my long-term goal and vision is to also put in a home golf simulator within that office. So. A lot, of, a lot of changes coming. I don't know the exact timeline on that last one. And as far as building a home office, time will tell on how that works out and how the whole build thing goes. But those are the intentions. Uh, let me know if you have questions or thoughts on uh, how to get to the, uh, the ODC building. It will be an upstairs office. So if there's anyone who needs to meet with me that in person that has issues with stairs, there is a downstairs uh, conference room option as well. So we can definitely make that work. No worries there. So. With that, I don't see any questions yet, but I'm happy to answer them if anyone has any. I will jump into an article here that I found here that hopefully is valuable and maybe it will prompt some questions or thoughts from the audience. So the first thing I found here was, it's an article on Morningstar.com titled, What History Tells Us About the Fed's Next Move? There's been a lot of conversation and uh, guesswork around the Fed and the interest rates and how, one, how that's gonna affect our interest rates at the bank, our interest rates in buying homes, and the stock market itself. And it also, in case you haven't heard, it's an election year. So it could be an interesting year to keep up with the news. Keep in mind, the news is just news. It is not fact. Most of it's conjecture or fear-mongering because they want you to get clicks. I just believe it's important to stay up to date with what's 
being said so that we can kind of pick through what may or may not be true or at least try to learn from it as time goes on, not to try to predict the future. That's that's a losing game in my opinion. So here's here we go. It's written by Sarah Hansen. She says, the Fed has been here before, sort of. The Federal Reserve will take will make a decision on interest rates this week against a very different backdrop than a few months, months ago or even a few days ago. Amid new data showing that inflation remains stubborn, financial markets are rapidly pa paring back their expectations for interest rate cuts this year. Bond future traders started 2024 believing there would be six cuts in total, with the first coming as early as March. Three months later, three months of hotter than anticipated consumer price index data pushed the predicting time, predicted timing of the first cut to summer and reduced the year's total number of cuts to three. Pretty big difference. This past week, new data showed an unfortunate, an unfortunate double whammy for markets, slowing gross domestic product growth and an unexpectedly high reading on the personal consumption expenditures price index, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Now investors are bracing for the possibility that the first interest rate cut won't come until the fall, or even as late as December, or maybe not until next year. Through the, the fall of 2023, stock and bond markets soared amid growing optimism that the central bank might achieve a perfect soft landing and be able to cut rates. Inflation was slowing, the economy was growing, and the labor market remained resilient. But now, with progress on inflation appearing to stall out, the fate of the economy and the outlook for rate cuts is looking more complicated. Thursday's GDP data definitely throws a wrench in the Goldilocks scenario, says James R Reagan, Director of Wealth Management Research at DA Davidson. The combination of slowing growth and higher inflation is not an ideal outcome. What to expect from the May Fed meeting? For Sam Ryan's macro strategist at Wisdom Tree, the Fed's May meeting will be more of the same. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think the FOMC is going to be very happy about the current pricing because it gives them optionality, he explains. Bond future markets are 97% certain that the central bank will hold rates steady at its target range of 525 to 5.5% next week, according to the CME FedWatch tool. The Fed is said to announce its next decision on interest rates Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So that was yesterday. What did they say? Um, Fed interest rate decision. Well, actually, I think we found it over here. All right, so this is, I'm gonna jump over the Axios market that I actually had pulled up to read since that was yesterday. Maybe we're gonna find our answer. This is the fun of doing things live. I can learn with you and also have egg on my face sometimes. So here's the article from Axios Markets. I get an email from them daily. It's a pretty good news article that's relatively in the middle when it comes to avoiding politics. I can't stand reading things that are very obviously biased one way or the other. So I try to find things that are more down the middle and just more factual. So here's the Axios Markets email that I'm happy to forward to you so you can get on their, um, on their list if you'd like. I don't know how, how I would attach it for you to access in the comments. So here we go. It says Axios Markets, we're closing in on the weekend, folks. Thursday is basically the new Friday, right? One big thing about the rate hike pain. Higher interest rates were supposed to bring a lot of pain for Americans. So far, that has not happened. Why it matters. The Federal Reserve left interest rates unchanged yesterday, so they decided to leave them. Um, there's your answer. Keeping rates at 23-year highs, but in, this, in his afternoon news, conference Fed Chair Jerome Powell made it clear he's ready to pivot in the event the pain makes an appearance. The intrigue. When the Fed started hiking rates in 2022, some progressives feared that higher interest rates would eventually drive up unemployment, causing a lot of pain. That hasn't happened. The job market is incredibly strong. We thought, and most people thought, there would have to be probably significant dislocations somewhere in the economy, perhaps the labor market, to get inflation all the way down from the very high levels it was at, Powell said. That didn't happen. That's a tremendous result, he added. State of play. Rich folks are, to put it technically, crushing it in the high rate world. For middle and high earners, especially those who own homes outright or who locked in cheap mortgages, it's a fairly sunny moment, Gianna, Gina Smiliak writes in the New York Times. Home values are nearly 50% higher than pre-pandemic levels, and they're still rising, per Kay Schiller. The stock market is near record highs, and you can actually earn interest on your savings. If you didn't notice, uh, for those of my clients, we have uh, Altruist just came out with a cash account that's paying 5.1% current yield, up to a million dollars FDIC insurance. So. Even though long term, I would not encourage you to just leave your money in cash. Uh, generally speaking, right, it takes 
specific planning to answer that for each individual. But in the short term, why not get 5.1% rather than maybe 0.1%, right? So be aware of what your options are, especially if you have a large lump sum just sitting in cash. Inflation literally it will make your money less valuable a year from now and two years from now and three years from now than it is if it's, if it's just sitting there and not actually growing. So the other side, the experience of lower income Americans is more mixed. They're experiencing a great labor market and historically high rates of real wage growth. They're also feeling the pain of higher borrowing costs for auto loans and credit card debt while rate, rising mortgage rates are putting home buying, buying out of reach for those trying to get a foot up on the ownership ladder. Delinquency rates on credit cards and auto loans are now rising past their pre-pandemic levels. On car loans, that increase is most pronounced for those in low-income areas, per data from the New York Fed. The big picture. There are a lot of comp competing narratives over how rate hikes affect Americans. Going into, into 2022, the understanding was that if you keep rates high for long enough, you'd break the job market as happened in the 1970s. Since that hasn't happened yet, there have been some new attempts at figuring this all out. One possibility is that the Fed hikes haven't had much effect, as Axios and Neil Irwin recently wrote. What to watch? The job, jobs report out tomorrow, so today, will give us an update on the state of the labor market. We'll see if we can find one here when we're done with this. The bottom line, there's no doubt the monetary policy has a huge effect on markets and the financial sector. Its effects on everyday Americans, however, are more tenuous. All right, so let's see if the job report is out today. Since we're jumping around here. U.S. job report. I'm not seeing any articles out today, so they must not have announced it, or I'm just not seeing it. I apologize. I would be kind of fun to learn on the fly what, what's going on there. But, all right. The, and the second part of this um, email is, no, I'm not going to talk about that, the sentiment divide. All right. The third part is Americans cash out of sustainable funds. Flows into U.S. sustainable funds have actually gone down in the last in the first quarter of 2024. Uh, so, so U.S. sustainable investment funds, including ETFs, suffered their worst ever exodus in Q1. They saw $8.8 .8 billion in net outflows per new data from Morningstar. Why it matters, the outflows stands in stark contrast to consistent inflows through the first quarter of 2022 and to the continued net inflows to sustainable funds outside the United States. Sustainable funds are defined by Morningstar as open-end funds and ETFs that focus on sustainability, impact, or ESG factors. So basically, people are decreasing how much they're contributing to funds that are focused on sustainability, possibly because they're more focused on their own personal return than maybe the impact of the fund itself. Follow the money. Europe saw $10.9 billion in net inflows in the first quarter of this year down significantly from a high of $133 billion in the fourth quarter of 2021, but still positive. The big picture, Europe is home to the overwhelming majority of the world's $3 trillion in sustainable funds, accounting for more than $2.5 trillion of the total. That's up 37% from when we last checked in on these funds in mid-2021. Meanwhile, even after investing investment gains, U.S. sustainable funds assets under management are up less than 12% since Q1 2021 to $335 billion in total. So clearly Europe is a lot more focused on sustainable funds than we are. Between the lines, when interest rates rise, these that makes the future less valuable compared to the present. That's bad news for the ESG investments, which broadly seek to bet on a brighter, greener future rather than on next quarter's cash flows. The continued politici politicization of ESG investing also played a role in pushing Americans out of the asset class, notes Morningstar. The bottom line, in the U.S., sustainable investi investing seems to have missed its moment. All right. So any questions, thoughts, anything we've talked about so far? If not, I'm going to jump back to the Morningstar article quick to wrap up the... No, we've talked enough about interest rates. I'm bored of interest rates. I don't want to talk about that anymore unless someone has a question. 
Instead, I'm going to jump over to a article from dimensional.com. It is titled, sorry, I'm having technical issues here. Oh, the page not being found. So apparently I can't read the article that I want to read. That's not helpful. The article was going to be about pensions and investments, dimensionals, COSEO, tox ETFs, and going beyond indexing, but that doesn't seem to be working. So instead, let's just see if there's any new retirement planning news out there. We got 10 minutes left. I'm willing to stay on until 9.30 if there are some questions or thoughts that someone would like me to address. Uh, otherwise, I'll wrap it up around 9 o'clock. All right. This article is from USA Today, written yesterday. It says, majority of Americans over, fi over 50 worry they won't have enough money for a retirement. And this is a study. And it says, among AARP survey findings, 61% of Americans 50 and up are worried they won't have enough money for retirement, and only 21% of people have a retirement plan. One out of five. Now, I know I'm biased because I think everyone should have a financial retirement plan or financial plan, retirement plan, but one out of five is really low. Um, just like anything else in life, if you don't have a plan, where are you going to end up? Right? Are you going to end up where you want to end up, or are you going to end up wherever just Something random, some random event in your life determines you should end up. Uh, if you go to work on a daily basis without a plan of what you're going to execute, are you really going to be that efficient, right? So the best way to reach your financial goals is to one, establish what they are, and then second, establish a plan to get there. So I would strongly encourage anyone and everyone who has not had this conversation with someone they yet to go out and have at least have the first one. Now you might find you're not quite ready yet, but at least you've got that process started, or you might find you can do a lot more than you thought you could. Um, even if you can't save new money, uh, amazing story. So one of Ross's, uh, one of our Ross's clients we're looking at right now, they can literally increase their the value of their asset. I won't get into details, but they can increase the value of an asset they've already established by over 10% by s simply repositioning it. With more guarantees and ever like it's gonna be pretty much built the same as it was, but it'll have more guarantees and be 10% more valuable just by simply shifting it to a different place. So sometimes just looking at what your options are with the money you've already saved can be a valuable use of a, building a plan or at least looking at stuff rather than just assuming it's fine because it's always been where it's currently at. So with that in mind, continuing on with the article. An increasing number of people are worried that they won't have enough money to live comfortably in retirement, and men aren't as financially secure as they once were, according to an annual survey by the American Association of Retired Persons, AARP. The AARP Financial Security Trends Survey, released in January, included interviews with more than 8,300 Americans over 30 across every state in the country. Conducted by NORC at the University of Chicago, the survey aims to analyze the financial experiences and attitudes among Americans. One of the survey's biggest findings is that 61% of those 50 and up are worried they won't have enough money for retirement. Indiria Venkat, Senior Vice President of Research at AARP, told USA Today on Wednesday. And if you break those numbers down even more, one in five people who have not retired have no savings at all. Oof, that's scary. And thus you never want to retire. Um, among retirement savers who are Keep in mind, even if you don't think you'll ever retire, you, your body or your finance or your fi uh, physical or just your life, of, there might be a life event that forces you to, right? So we don't always get to work as long or in the same capacity that we always want to. Um, I know, unfortunately, a lot of people who have been forced into retirement or forced to scale back due to a life event of some sort. So it's, uh, I'm, again, I might be biased, but I, I would strongly encourage everyone to have a financial plan. Um, those numbers should be a wake-up call for all of us, he said. Adults are worried about having enough for retirement. What does this mean? Venkat said the reason some people may be worried about saving for retirement is because they don't have access to retirement plans through their jobs. 
Today, almost half of those who are in the private sector workforce, and that's 57 million workers, don't have the option to save retirement through their work, she said. People who have access to retirement plans are more likely to save, she said. Another reason for retirement woes is inflation. Calling it a bread and butter and kitchen table issue, she said many people are struggling to afford basic necessities and gas. In fact, over 70% of all respondents expressed concern about pricing, r- prices rising at a faster rate than their income, which is definitely unfair. And that's why, unfortunately, whether it's your retirement savings or your income, we have to actually increase each year just to maintain our lifestyle because inflation always happens due to changing the, how the dollar is not based on gold and things like that. Um, to address the part about how 57 million workers don't have access to retirement plans through their work, so therefore they're less likely to save, if that's you, there are many options out there to save without it having to be a 401k or a IRA or something like that. Like You can still definitely save and set up a very successful retirement plan without having a group option. All right, so don't let that be... Don't let access through your work be the reason you can't retire successfully one day is what I'm trying to say. There are definitely options out there for you to consider. Many people also have month-to-month balances on credit cards, she said. According to the researchers, the average amount of credit card debt carried from month-to-month increased from 7,538 in January 2023 to 8,169 in January 2024. Gender and financial planning. And AARP noted findings among men specifically, among men who are regularly saving for retirement, 28% are saving 10% or more of their income. In January 2022, more men, 35%, were saving 10% or more. Other findings include, so that's a 7% decrease. So other findings include 40% of men are worried about basic expenses, up from 33% in January 2022. 42% of all men aged 30 and up describe their financial situation as only fair or poor, up from 34% in January 2022, 43% of men carry a credit card balance, up 38% in January 2022, and 62% of men have emergency savings today, down 69% in January 2022. We are seeing that men today are, are a little bit more worried than they were in prior years about their financial security and situation, Bankett said. 42% of men, if they are asked to, to describe their financial situation, say it's terrible. Not a great feeling. The team also compared responses among men and women, finding that 62% of men are more likely to have an emergency savings versus 58% of women. 42% of men are less likely to be worried about managing debt versus 47% of women. 61% of men with debt are more likely to view their debt as manageable versus 52% of women. Limitations of the survey. Benkett said the survey was very robust and was done using probability samples, but one limitation is that it was conducted in English and Spanish only. To the extent there are other dominant spoken languages in the home, those individuals are not represented in the study, she said, and then, of course, the standard margin of error with any survey applies. So financial planning among survey respondents, there were some surprising findings surrounding financial planning, Benkett said. Among older adults who are not yet retired, 94% said it's important for them to have a plan to manage their money during retirement. I would agree. Among them, just 21% of them said they have a plan. So isn't that fascinating? 94% of them said that it's important to have one, but only 21% have actually built one. Big disconnect there, right? Like I said, I know we always think we have more time, we'll just do it some other time. The problem with money and compounding and the the miracle that it is, the more time you are in your plan and you are saving and you have your money invested, the the way more significantly valuable it's gonna be for you long-term. If we keep pushing it out forever, it's gonna be really hard to catch up. So I use this example all the time, but if you save, uh, let's say $10,000 a year for 40 years, you will have significantly more money than if you save $40,000 a year for 10 years. It's the same amount of money in, but the time factor makes such a massive difference that it's so important that even if it's just a dollar a day, the earlier you can get started, the better. Today is the best day you can get started if you haven't already. If you don't today, tomorrow's the best day, right? So if you know it's important, I know there's a lot going on in your life, but I strongly encourage you to start with a conversation. See where you, where you can at least get started. With that, she said, she said AARP has a resource to help people plan, inclu- including tools like a social security calculator, an AARP retirement calculator, a required minimum distribution calculator, and a 401k calculator. The concerns respondents expressed while completing the survey further prove the importance of having a plan for retirement, AARP says, and I agree. 
plans need to address not only how to build savings during your working years, the company writes, but also how to spend money in retirement in a way that will allow it to last. 100%. And that's a big part of what we focus on and why we specialize in retirement planning specifically is because there's a big difference between going into retirement and being afraid of running out of money before you run out of breath so you don't enjoy it versus on the other side, spending your money way too fast and running out of money before you're out of breath, right? We wanna to try to find that middle ground where we can maximize your lifestyle without risking the, the without risking running out of money. That's, that's what we're always trying to achieve through guardrails and war chests and things like that. So I agree with a lot of things comment in this study. It's just, I think it's like kind of getting healthy. A lot of people, we wanna get healthier, but we don't necessarily take the actions to do it. You could read about push-ups all day long. You aren't actually gonna get stronger unless you go do them. You can read about financial planning and investing and all this stuff all day long. You're not going to actually improve your financial situation without actually doing something about it, right? So take action, talk to someone you trust, or at least if you don't know someone you trust yet, start having conversations till you find someone that you might trust and like, and they can guide you through that. And if you wanna do it on your, on your own, that's fine. Doing it your own is better than not doing it at all. However, Keep in mind, every single professional athlete in the world still has a coach because having a secondary person that is not as emotionally attached to the outcome as you are, giving you advice and having, having an ability to bounce ideas off them is extremely valuable. Using golf, for example, the best golfers in the world, Scotty Scheffler, Tiger Woods, all these people, they have multiple coaches, right? They're the best at what they do, but it doesn't mean that they only want to take their opinion, especially in the heat of the moment. So. That's all. I don't see any questions. Um, hopefully today's conversation, as always, is valuable for you and everyone, whether you watch live or later on. I genuinely appreciate your time. I know time is the most valuable resource we have. So the fact that you're willing to share it with me, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you again to my parents, my wife, Ross, and all of my clients and all the other people who have had an impact on my journey so far as a financial advisor. I look forward to what the next 10, 20, 30 years brings in my career. And I appreciate everyone, appreciate every single one of you, whether you're my client or not, taking the time and being willing to watch my content, provide feedback, allows me to improve myself and improve the value I can bring. Uh, so please reach out if you have comments, concerns, or recommendations to improve for the future, as well as if you're willing, I, I would really appreciate it if you would share the posts that you see so I can hopefully provide more value to more people, comment with your thoughts, and or like the post at the very minimum to show that you at least stop by. All right, thank you guys so much for your time. Again, it is May 2nd. I hope everyone has a wonderful day and hopefully we can get some little warmer and drier weather ahead uh, other than of course the farmers, hopefully you're getting the right amount of rain. So good luck to a great year and have a great day, bye.